So we included all the horizontal screens uh, routinely which we perform. We routinely planned accordingly how we used to plan in application techniques. We did not, it did not differ from the routine uh, technique because we just, uh, we just modified a single step. I have a video, I'll show you the video. So we have holded the muzzle with the forceps and we are slowly rolling it over. As you can see, since there is a gap, there is no crushing of the uh, ciliary vessels. And we are only using a single forceps. After uh, folding the muzzle, then we are passing the uh, 60 vicryl suture. As you can see, we have tied the suture. From one end we have tied, then we'll slowly remove the muzzle, uh, sorry, forceps. As you can see, there is a fold and the ciliary vessel is also spared. Then we will uh, suture the inferior end. And as now you can see the marked end has moved forward. Similarly, we can do the uh, lateral leg test plication also. Here we have used a serrated forcep. Uh, since the space is more in the lateral side, temporal side, we can use uh, these forceps and uh, similar results we can achieve. So we have tried it in uh, with four, five, four to nine mm applications and we found a similar, similar results. We did, uh, the main advantage of this uh, technique was, since uh, uh, this study was uh, done in uh, RPC AMS, since we have many trainee senior residents and uh, new uh, uh, nursing staff, we, we felt that the, this rollover technique uh, by using a forceps was simpler comp compared to the traditional method where we used an iris repositor. And even the assistant nursing staff also felt that the forceps which we told them to roll and hold it, they also felt that manure was better. So the main advantage of this technique was to uh, obviate the necessity of two or uh, three instruments like muzzle hook, lens hook and iris repositor for anteriorly placing the muzzle over sclera before suturing. And the assistant is a great, uh, assistant also felt a great comfort while maintaining the muzzle position uh, before uh, taking the final scleral bites. And the forceps directed rollover creates an optimal fold, avoiding unnecessary pulling or undue anterior folding. The scler scleral sutures are also passed more conf confidently with clearly ap appreciated plication effect. And additional reinforcement uh, bites can also be taken from the muzzle. So to conclude, it's a simple uh, technique which can be done, I think, uh, and can be learned by easy, very easily by new surgeons and can be done by routine surgeons also. And our technique has an advantage over the traditional techniques in the ease of instrument handling by reducing the number of instrument. Thank you. Uh, that was a good presentation, but I have just one question. When you were evaluating this technique over a, a normal routine plication, yes, you've not given us any data regarding the improvement of the strabismus or whatever. Like, there was uh, no this data. This is only that. a single step, ma'am. Uh, we have uh, the normative data which we plan for screen correction is the same. Like traditional no, the results of this over a normal plication, yes, don't you think we, that we, should have been... Uh, we uh, did not include a comparative compare. arm. We wanted to do, I mean, we wanted to see whether this technique, how easy it is. No, but along, is yeah. Result, based. Exactly. result we, have, we found it similar to the routine. You've not so you should have mentioned that. No? Yeah, you and what about the hump that is created? It is similar to the one that traditional... Uh, and more or less same. same. Just one step which we usually find difficult because the re approximation of the marked end is the main difficulty when we, whenever we are suturing it because the assistant has to hold with an iris repositor, then we have to pull it. Then while uh, passing the suture, uh, both the hands should be free. So yeah. the main assistant dependent procedure, this is an assistant dependent procedure which we wanted to make it easier. Oh, it's a that very was good our main technique aim. and appearing easy also, and but we, we have any easy procedure can't be taken up unless and until we know yeah, the we results. Have, we have uh, done in 50 patients now. Okay. So results are no, same. We should have mentioned that. You should have presented the data at least, the comparison okay. between a routine that plication is very and important. a roll-over, I think. Okay. That I mean, would have made so your study more We did not change effective. the planning, I mean plan we did not change, only the step which we have changed, that's no, no. why we have. You must have, I know, the, the the work which you have done would definitely be good, but I think when you're presenting a free paper, the results should be projected. I mean, when you're comparing it with the, any other surgery to make it more authentic, I think. Okay. But anyway, overall, I because think it's a good technique. Because we get different, different screens, like one squint has a 45 prism deviation, one squint has 30 <laughs> So now you do a study where you compare different uh, types of squints and different types of We have of seen them, different, different amounts of plication we have seen. Like for 4 mm plication, 9 mm plication, we have uh, seen, but we did not find any major difference. 
in terms of ease uh, of rolling that muzzle. That's why we thought, main, we have to first propose the technique. No, definitely. definitely. Okay. okay, thank you, Dr. Thank Sujit. You. Thanks a lot. Yeah, may I please uh, request the next speaker to come on, Dr. Uh, Singh Rahul. Is he there? Is he here? Co-author, co Dr. Disha, anybody here for, for this paper? Okay, we'll move on. Next is um, Dr. Avni. Are you here? Please come. Dr. Avni will be talking about effect of botulinum toxin on strabismus associated with Duane retraction syndrome. A very good morning to one and all present here. I'm Dr. Avni Haryani, and I would like to thank AIOS for letting me present my work on evaluation of effect of botulinum toxin on strabismus associated with Duane retraction syndrome. I have no financial interest in the subject matter being presented. Duane retraction syndrome is a type of congenital cranial disinnervation disorder. The main features of DRS are deviation in the primary gaze, abnormal head posture, globe retraction, and overshoots on attempted adduction. The classification of DRS was given by Huber, uh, which is based on an electrophysiological study with type 1 in which abduction is more limited than adduction, type 2 adduction is more limited than abduction, type 3 both are similarly limited and divided into subtypes A, B, C. Botulinum toxin is FDA approved and has been used as a muscle weakening procedure in conditions like congenital esotropia, paralytic strabismus and thyroid orbitopathy. However, there's a paucity of literature when it comes to its role in Duane retraction syndrome and therefore a study aimed at assessing its effect in DRS. Our study was a prospective intervention cohort study conducted in Department of Ophthalmology, Guru Nanak Eye Center, New Delhi for a study period of one year. Our study population included 25 eyes of patients with age of more than or equal to seven years. Patient with type 1, 2, 3 DRS, both unilateral and bilateral, were taken into the study. And the patients with following complaints had presentation of ocular misalignment more than equal to 15 prism diopters, abnormal head posture, retraction and overshoot phenomenon more than or equal to grade 2. Patients with any known neuromuscular disorder, previous squint surgery or botulinum toxin injection, pattern strabismus and hypersensitivity to botulinum toxin were excluded. Um, FDT was performed under topical an anesthesia prior to injection and Botox 50 units vial was 0.1 ml was injected in the concerned muscle uh, using Normal head posture also decreased from 11.58 degrees to 7.86 degrees with a significant P value. The graph shows a tenth of degrees in the mean angle of deviation and the abnormal head posture at different time intervals. Treatment was considered successful if the residual deviation was less than 8 prism diopters based on less than 5 degrees and globe retraction and overshoots when it decreased to less than or equal to grade 1. Treatment was considered partially successful if there was any improvement but not meeting the above criteria and failure if there was no significant improvement. On one week follow-up, six of a patient showed complete success, 12 showed partial success, while seven failed to show any significant result. We also found out that there was a significant relation between the successful outcome and the pre-intervention FDD, with success being more with the mild to moderate restriction of grade 1 or grade 2 FDD. There were also cases of mitosis that absolutely resolved within two months, not requiring any further intervention. Now we see a 17-year-old boy with bilateral type 1 Duane retraction syndrome with pseudotropia, globe retraction and overshoot phenomenon. Post botulinum toxin in the left eye median rectus, the esotropia, globe retraction and overshoot improved. 
but however limitation and adduction was noted. In the other patient, a 28 year old girl with the left eye type 1 DRS with exotropia and the grade 2 globe retraction and a grade 4 overshoot phenomenon, improved post botulinum toxin injection in the left eye lateral rectus, so the exotropia, globe retraction and overshoots they improved. Surgery is the mainstay for treatment of DRS but is not advised anytime. There is a mismatch between surgical success and patient's expectations and desired outcomes, leading to often multiple surgeries and disappointment for both the surgeon and the patient. Botulinum toxin, in conclusion, we want to say that botulinum toxin has a diagnostic role in management of DRS. It can be used to screen patients which may benefit or worsen due to surgery, help them decide their course of action, give them an insight into their condition and help them set realistic expectations. Most of the patients who had some excess uh, some success post botulinum toxin injection proceeded with their decision for surgery. Botulinum toxin also has a therapeutic role as a temporary solution, but whether maintenance therapy uh, with repeated injection is a viable option is out of scope for the study. We found out there are certain predictive factors like age with higher success rate seen in younger uh, age groups yeah. before the onset of uh, muscle sequelae and uh, FDT has an inverse relation with the success rate. In conclusion, a prospective study which is more inclusive has a larger sample size, a longer follow-up and a comparative group consisting of patients who have undergone surgery post botulinum toxin injection is required to give recommendations on use of botulinum toxin as a diagnostic and therapeutic role in DRS. Thank you.
financial interests. Acute acquired committant esotropia is a type of acquired, non-accommodative esoderiation with sudden onset, often associated with diplopia, but same in all case positions, seen in previously straight-eyed young children, but can occur in older kids, adults, and even in the elderly. Classically, three subtypes have been described. Swan type, which occurs after a period of interrupted binocularity. The Berean Francis T type with minimal hypermetropy and double vision, precipitated with physical or psychological stress. The Belchewski type, seen in myopes with convergence, spasm, and divergence paralysis. Then the refractive accommodative type, which is previously missed, which can be adequately controlled with refractive correction alone, and the lesser common entity of an intracranial pathology manifesting as an esoteriation, often a posterior fossa lesion. So we know that with the COVID-19 pandemic, with the new norm of work, study, and play from home, life has changed tremendously for us. It was estimated that a total of 320 million learners in India transitioned into e-learning, and the global number of workers working from home rose to 558 million. So with the increasing dependence on gadgets for studies, work and leisure, we found a substantial number of kids and young adults coming to the hospital with recent onset of input deviation and double vision, which prompted us to do this study. So this was a retrospective clinical study. investigations like autopsic evaluation, imaging, and a neurological workup was also done. So these were our results. We had total 15 cases, 11 males and 4 females. 73.3% percent presented with double vision and screen, and the mean duration of presentation was 2.98 months. So you can see here the majority about 10 years, mean age of 16.8 years. Most of them were students, 73.3%, and the rest were employed. There was no precipitating event other than excess near work in most of the patients except one patient who gave history of fever prior to the onset of esoteriation. So you can see here, majority had more than 8 hours of near work and the most common medium of near work was smartphones in about 86.3%. The most common activity was online classes in 53.3%, office work in 20%, leisure or mobile games in 20% and religious text reading in 6.7% patients. So majority in the study were hypermetropes and the rest were myopes. Interestingly, three out of the five myopes admitted to doing near work without glasses during the pandemic. So if you see the ESO deviation for distance, the average was 22.73% diopters as compared to 18.73% diopters for near. There was good stereopsis for near in most of the patients, though majority had double vision on words for dot test for distance. So orthoptic evaluation did not yield any concrete results, though it had some discrepancies. So all those with pre-existing or newly detected refractive errors were given classes, and all those with or at risk of amblyopia advised occlusion therapy. All were advised to restrict and reduce the near work, especially on mobiles. Those with divergence, insufficiency, esodeviation were given divergent exercises occlusion. The reduction of near work for divergent exercises was helpful in five patients. And all those with basic type of deviation, if they were not in... ...pre-opa and post op pictures of the patients. So we found four categories of patients with AAP in our study. Myopes with divergent insufficiency esodeviation, which could be classified as a Belcherisky type. Low hypermetropes with basic type of deviation. Low hypermetropes with divergence insufficiency and a moderate hypermetrope with uh, stress or fever precipitating the ESO deviation, which could be classified as Berrien Francis T type. Except in the last patient, the only common factor in all other patients was excessive near work either on smartphone, laptop, or books. So, when we did a literature search, we found comparable studies by Lee et al., Yandu et al., and Aldo Vague had reported four cases of AAPE in the COVID 19 lockdown in Italy in 2020. He had earlier reported that in children with AAPE, prompt amblyopia uh, therapy and timely surgery can result in satisfactory outcomes in those without systemic involvement. So how did this happen? 
Increasing use of smartphones and tablets in modern life leads to more and more work at small screen at a very close distance. So this leads to an imbalance between accommodation and virgins and naturally stronger convergence in the young overtakes leading to a dynamic activation of the medial rectus muscles, development of a manifest vasodilation. And this effect is more common in hypermetrops as was also seen in our study. What about myopes? Now, a myope can also develop esodeviation because of the habit of holding book and text close to the eyes. This leads to increased tone of the medial rectus muscle, coupled with a lack of distant stimuli, leading to a divergence weakness and a manifest esodeviation. So, continuing school closure, home confinement and work from home policies have led to many important lifestyle changes in the young population. Another troublesome but lesser known side effect would be this of acute acquired comitant esodeviation. To conclude, the habit of long time to stay near work can increase the risk of AACE and parents and public health authorities should take note of this serious effect and make suitable recommendations and regulations to mitigate this undesirable effect. Thank you. These would be my references. Among the myopes, three out of the five myopes uh, were doing near work without glasses because they re they thought, okay, I mean everything is near. I can see very well from here. Why should I use my glasses? That was, but majority were low hypermetropes in our study. Yes, ma'am. That is, if it is not, uh, if I rule out an accommodative component by doing an occipital diffraction and giving them glasses, even if it is very low hypermetropia, we do give a trial of glasses and we see if there is any other uh, history of any viral disease or any prodromal uh, disease which would have caused. If it is not there and if it is remaining the same, I do order a new imaging because uh, we have previously reported a case of uh, glioma presenting as AACE. So a new imaging is done in all, especially if they are fitting into this uh, this category of patients. So you have all the different yes, screens. yes. So now we are uh, advocating that uh, all of them shift to larger screens, even if they have have to do a near work. I mean, online classes go to larger screen screens, and uh, there has been a reduced incidence. This was maximum in 2020 when we just shifted to uh, the e-learning. Good morning everyone. My topic is Oculocardiac Reflex Incidence in Traditional Surgery, a cross-sectional study. Uh, so, uh, by definition, Oculocardiac Reflex is reduction in heart rate secondary to any eye pressure uh, placed on eyeball. So, uh, it could be due to facial trauma, it could be due to uh, traditional surgery, it could be due to any intraocular surgery or extraocular surgery. The incidence which has been reported is from uh, is varies from 14% to 90% and it is inversely associated with age, meaning pediatric patients are more at risk. The severity and the wide range of incidence which we see could be due to the anesthetic consideration, the hypoxia, hypercardia which are felt and due to the surgical condition. So it can cause detrimental effects including bradycardia, potentially fa fatal arr arrhythmias, asystole and even in Real cases, cardiac arrest. Among non-cardiac events, uh, hypotensive episodes can occur, syncope and gastrointestinal responses like nausea and vomiting can occur because of oculocardiac reflex. So why does it occur? So basically the stress, re uh, stress re receptors present on the ocular muscles, when they get uh, uh, stimulated, then the oculocardiac reflex uh, gets stimulated. So basically the afferent arc is of long ciliary nerves, uh, short ciliary nerves, which are the branches of trigeminal nerve. They then go to the ciliary ganglion. Then the afferent arc is further 
further consists of the ophthalmic branch of cranial nerve, uh, uh, fifth cranial nerve, which goes into the trigeminal ganglion, and then it uh, goes into the main sensory nucleus of trigeminal nerve, and the motor nucleus of vagus nerve is stimulated, which then depresses the cardiac uh, rhythm, uh, cardiac rate. So basically, a sinus bradycardia occurs because of the stimulation of the trigeminal vagus uh, uh, arc. So objectives of our study was to estimate the incidence of oculocardiac reflex in patients of strabismus surgery and to explore the various surgical factors responsible for the oculocardiac reflex. So what we did was we conducted a cross-sectional study from September 20 to 2020 to June 2021 in our center. The inclusion criteria were squint patients, non-cardiac and non-hypertensive patients, and the exclusion criteria were cardiac and hypertensive patients. After uh, IEC clearance, we, uh, we took written informed consent from all the patients, and in case of pediatric patients, assent was also taken. Uh, under anesthetic consideration, the patient underwent a uh, pre-anesthetic checkup, and all patients were kept nilpororal for six hours before surgery. In the operating room, pre-validated monitoring, monitoring devices including echocardiography, non-invasive uh, blood pressure monitoring, and pulse oximetry were attached. Pre-medication pre was given in injection, uh, included injection glycoparolate, which, has, which other studies have reported to decrease the rate of uh, uh, occurrence of oculocardiac reflex was used, followed by odensetron and then injection butrophenol. After pre-oxygenation for three minutes, induction was done with 1.5 to 2 milligram per kg IV of propofol. Then injection atracorium was given and then to facilitate the endotracheal intubation. The patient was ventilated for three minutes and then intubation was done. After that, bilateral air entry was checked and the tube was fixed. Anesthesia was maintained and all patients were given, after that, and uh, all patients were given a uh, peribulbar block, which consisted of six milliliter of uh, xylocaine and four ml of uh, sensorcaine. In the eye that underwent strabismus surgery. Heart rate was observed every five minutes. Under operative uh, considerations, we operated in uh, under uh, normally uh, like we did in every patient. After cleaning and draping, universal speculum was applied, and two stretching sutures were uh, given, in, uh, which is 3-0 nylon at the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock position. After that, conjunctival flap was formed and the muscle was dissected. Muscle was secured with 6-0 vicral sutures uh, and uh, then recessed and resect according to the patient's angle of deviation and to the standardized values. Then the muscle was reinserted on sclera. Same procedure was followed for the other muscle if required. The conjunctiva was reattached with 6-0 vicryl and antiseptic dressing was done. What uh, uh, data we collected? We collected the demographic pra parameters. Heart rate was measured at four, instance, uh, four instances, uh, uh, was noted at four instances, which is baseline. Then when muscle was dissected, maximum at maximum traction and when muscle was cut. Any change in heart rate from the baseline was observed. If there was uh, more than 20% reduction in heart rate, then it was considered as oculocardiac reflex present. In the patients in which the oculocardiac reflex was present, number of muscles that were taken up for surgery and which muscle uh, was being recessed or resect was noted. The incidence of oculocardiac reflex was noted and the level of significance of association of ocular factors responsible and occurrence of oculocardiac reflex was uh, calculated by using a chi-square test. So in our study, a total of 65 patients uh, were included, 40 were uh, females and 25 were males, and the age ranged from 10 to 35. Uh, years out of these, uh, out, out of the 65 patients, 45 patients had esotropia and 20 patients had exotropia. Uh, a total of 90 muscles were operated and medial rectus, uh, in, which included 65 medial rectus muscles, uh, out of which 45 were resected and 20 were recessed, and 25 lateral rectus muscles, out of which 18 were resected and 7 were recessed. So in our study, uh, uh, seven patients developed uh, oculocardiac reflex and rest didn't, and the median age uh, of the patients who developed oculocardiac reflex was 12.5, uh, and in the patients which did not develop, who did not develop oculocardiac reflex, the mean age was 20.5 years. Uh, uh, there was a significant association with age, uh, the p-value was less than 0 0.05. There was no significant association which was seen with gender, and with uh, patients with exotropia, all the patients who developed uh, oculocardiac reflex had exotropia, 
so we saw a, a, a p value of less than 0 0.05 for the patients who had exotropia so number uh, in this uh, in this table i can uh, baseline heart rate all the patients who developed oclocardiac reflex had a heart rate of uh, uh, mean heart rate of 120 uh, beats per minute and that patients without uh, ocr it was 112 beats per minute uh, all the patients who developed uh, oclocardiac reflex underwent two muscle surgery whereas in single muscle surgery none of the patients developed oclocardiac reflex in the patients who uh, operated uh, medial rectus muscles uh, in, uh, in which the patients were operated, uh, there was no significant association. But in the patients who had exotropia and the lateral rectus muscle was uh, resected or recessed, had uh, oclocardiac reflex. But this is, uh, I will discuss the same in, uh, uh, the, in discussion, why this happened. OK, OK, ma'am. So the incidence of oclocardiac reflex in our study was 10.7 percent, and uh, and uh, it, uh, significant association was seen with the age. No uh, significant association was seen with the gender. A significant association between oclocardiac reflex and exotropia was seen. This can be uh, this could be due to the uh, type of surgery it under, uh, they underwent, which was medial rectus resection. Baseline heart rate was higher in patients who developed oclocardiac reflex, but uh, result was not significant. Okay. So, limitations. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Medial rectus resection in the patients who underwent medial rectus resection, in those patients only we saw uh, oclocardiac reflex, the seven patients who. All, all, yeah, all patients underwent uh, general anesthesia, even the patients who were when above. Yeah. So basically, uh, the, the, track, the muscles should be handled gently. We should not be uh, uh, giving any kind of super traction. And also, one thing we observed was that if we give the patients anticholinergic drugs before the surgery, that is glycopyrrolate, then the patients responded much better. And the peribulbar blo block, definitely, it blocks the ciliary ganglion and everything. So that's also one way to prevent it. Okay. So okay. did you give peribulbar block in any Yeah, we did. All patients, we did. Yeah, that's that's uh, despite that. Uh, uh, despite also. So it seems like a lot. You have given glycopyrrolate. You are incubating the patient. You are giving. General anesthesia. Yeah, normally also. Ten, ten, ten point seven percent. Seems like a lot. Yeah, that's seven patients in all. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Only yeah, only surgeon, one surgeon operating. In a particular way, but it happens in more in muscles which are tight. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in your exotropia. So that's uh, that's a limitation of my study. I did not measure the traction, uh, the pressure which was applied, or uh, the other methods for uh, uh, the number. So in exotropia, it's usually the lateral, which is more. Tight. I mean, other that's generally making us question. Yeah, but it occurred when we held the medial rectus muscle. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that. Okay. okay ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Umi. <laughs> the, this is uh, similar to already. <laughs> a surge in acute acquired comitant isotropia during COVID lockdown. So uh, uh, there are a lot of studies showing I'll press the enter uh, uh, that 
acute acquired non accommodative comitant isotropia uh, uh, is a it's a, an uncommon type of isotropia and classified uh, into uh, three types by Berry and Miller in 1958 as the swan type following monocular occlusion Berry and Franz Shetty type associated with small refractive errors and minimal accommodative stress and Belchowski type uh, associated with the moderate myopia and result from excessive near work activities. Uh, neurological problems like Chiari malformation, posterior fossa tumors, and hydrocephalus have been uh, seen to be the culprit also, and what they warrant imaging. Excessive near work, including excessive smartphone use, have been found to be a cause. And with the advent of COVID-19 universal lockdown and introduction of web-based online classes, there has been a higher incidence, uh, which is attribu attributable to the stress and accommodative load. So this was a retrospective comparative analysis is to show that during COVID lockdown, there was a surge in the incidence of uh, AACE and compared to a similar period prior to COVID lockdown. So the medical records of all cases who presented with acute onset of committent non-accommodative isotropia to the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology in Comtrust Eye Hospital were analyzed and uh, they were classified into Group A, those during the period from June 2020 to August 2021 and Group B, those during the period from June 2018 to August 19, uh, 2019. That's a period uh, during COVID lockdown and similar period pre-COVID to avoid differences during examination times or other factors which might influence the number of cases. So all had a detailed history of thalmic evaluation and uh, muscle balance, ocular mortality, cycloplegic refraction, fundus, best corrected visual acuity, PBCT and accommodation facility and worth four dot test in older children. In the younger children, atropin refraction was done and MRI and neurological evaluation done in all cases and those patients who presented within three months of onset and were willing for Botox injection were given the same and followed up. Those who had stable angles after six months and showed no progress or recovery were taken up for surgical correction. So these were the number of cases, 41 cases in post uh, during COVID lockdown and 11 cases during a similar period pre-COVID. So the 79% of the total cases were during COVID lockdown, 60% of group A were males, uh, whereas 61% of group B were females. And 33 patients in group A, 80%, had more than three hours of smartphone use. And in group B, we did not get a proper history of smartphone use. Uh, age distribution majority, that is 70% group A, belong to age group 5 to 19 years and 44% were about between 10 to 19 years the, and the mean age was 11.23 years uh, in group A and uh, the mean age in uh, uh, group B was 73% in group B belong to 5 to 19 years and 45% were between 10 to 19 years. There were no patients below 5 years in group B and mean age was 16.7% 17 16.7 uh, years. And the presenting complaints, 44% uh, in group A, uh, complaint of diplopia and 55% of group B uh, presented with double vision. Uh, the type of uh, AAC during COVID period 38, that is 93% of group A belong to Berry and Franz Schutte group that is stress induced and only 9% of group A belong to Belchowski's type. And only one, that is 9% was Swan type. One patient had a pineal mass and was taken up by the neurosurgeon for surgery. Uh, and pre-COVID period, that is group B, six, that is only 55% of group B belong to Berry and Franz Schutte group. None showed Swan type. Four, that is 36% in group B belong to Belchowski type. And one had neurological findings in MRI with an arachnoid cyst and shearing like malformation in MRI, which according to the neurosurgeon was not significant. Uh, the mean angle of deviation for distance was 39 prisms, uh, varying between 18 to 70 and for near uh, 43, that is 20 to 70 in group A. And mean angle of deviation for distance was 33 prisms, that uh, varying between 25 to uh, 45 and for near 35 prisms, 25 uh, range between 25 to 50 in group B. And none of them showed accommodation abnormalities. Um, the mean spherical refractive error in A was plus 2 diopters ranging from minus 3 to uh, 
plus 4 with only one myopic, that is 2.4 percent. In B, mean spherical refractive error was minus 1 diopter, ranging between minus 5 to plus 2, two diopter, with the 4 being myopic. Mean best corrected visual acuity was 0.96 in all gr both groups. Uh, in group A, five patients had Botox injection, five uh, units to both medial recti, out of which four showed recurrence of squinting after uh, 12 weeks of uh, post-injection, and six patients had surgical correction. All had recess resection procedure with one, in one uh, with inferior oblique resection as well. In group B, three had Botox injection, all of whom, whom later recurred, and a recess resection was done. Six patients had recess resection after follow-up of deviation for stability. Uh, coming to discussion, web-based online classes and jobs have a great impact on visual demand, which is shown by the great number of AACE cases during lockdown. Majority of the cases, that is 93% during this lockdown period, was variant franchise type. And in pre-COVID series, the 36 patients belong to uh, Belchowski type. Lee et al. have shown all their cases to belo uh, belong to Belchowski type, whereas in group A, we had only one case in this type with myopia. Aldo Wag et al. reported four cases uh, with more than eight hours of near work during COVID lockdown, and Hayo Lee et al. Rep uh, reported 12 cases following excessive smartphone use. Amit Mohan et al. Uh, have shown a mean age of 12.5 years during the lockdown. Uh, in our case, 73% of our cases during the lockdown belong to age group 5 to 19 years, whereas 44% uh, 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 were between 11 to 19 years, which demands more online work, which also points to the causative factor as use of digital media, especially smartphones. Our mean age was 11.2 years. Awareness need to be created to the, uh, limit the smartphone use uh, for online classes. So, COVID lockdown has increased digital media use and a surge in AACE. The high percentage of students who need visual demand at online classes are at higher risk of developing AACE, and they need to be educated on visual hygiene at computer, and smartphone use uh, should be restricted uh, appropriately. Thank you. These are my references. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, where I think the previous study had more than two type three. Yes. So also I was observing that your study is showing not that they are comparing, but uh, increasing our knowledge. Like your the sex ratio also is similar in your study, but yes. uh, I think you mentioned more in males. Yes. Maybe that's because of the demographic or the media pattern. Uh, let's see, but uh, overall. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I invite Dr. Sumeda Sharma to uh, make her presentation, ocular surface changes in the operated eye and compare it with the non-operated eye after squint surgery. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my topic for today is comparison of ocular surface changes in operated. Yes, yes, I'm aware of that. Yes. We have no financial interest in the presentation. Uh, so dry is a multifactorial disease of the tears and ocular surface that results in symptoms of discomfort, visual disturbance, and tear film instability with the potential damage to the ocular surface. In recent years, because of uh, the life, uh, because of the living standard popularity of the computers and impact of environment, the morbidity of the dry is around 32%. Uh, the, diag the diagnosis of uh, dry is mainly by uh, the clinical presentation and by uh, the basic test, that is TBUT, and uh, 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 the Schirmer's test. Uh, so in our study, we did a dry, dry workup of patients undergoing strabismus surgery and compared it with the unoperated eye at the end of one month post-surgery. Uh, strabismus, as we all know, is defined as the misalignment of two visual axes, that is, uh, deviation of one of the eyes. Strabismus surgery for exotropia comprises of lateral rectus resection and medial rectus resection. The, uh, the muscle may be approached by limbal or uh, fornix root. Uh, 
so uh, in our study, we to out a uh, total of 50 patients in the uh, age group of 15 to 40 years uh, who had intermittent exotropia was ch uh, chosen. Fornix incision was taken on conjunctiva to explore the medial and the lat lateral rectus. Lateral rectus recession and medial rectus resection were done in all the patients. Uh, the patients who were excluded uh, were patient having uh, ocular uh, disease like blepharitis or lacrimal system disorders, ocular surface abnormality and uh, history of uh, diabetes, hypertension, collagenous uh, disease uh, and uh, use of topical or systemic drugs. Patients who had undergone LASIK surgery were also excluded uh, to prevent uh, because uh, these patients may have uh, tearful abnormality uh, beforehand. Uh, Sherma 1 and 2 tests were done and uh, tributary tests were done. Uh, normal value of Sherma is 20 mm and tributary is more than 10 seconds. Uh, all, the pa all the patients showed decreased value of Sherma test, both uh, 1 and 2 and tributary in the operated eye. Almost 46 patients out of 50 patients uh, showed severe reduction. There was no uh, there was no significant difference in PA value of the non-operated eye after one month of the surgery. However, there's a, there was a significant difference in PA value of the operated eye pre and post operatively. The uh, mean values are as shown in the table. So we can see that. Uh, uh, in the pre-operative uh, and post-operative uh, uh, period, uh, after one month, the eye which was uh, operated, it had significant uh, difference in both Shermer and TBUT tests. So the possible reasons because of which uh, it can happen, uh, uh, we uh, listed them uh, as follows. Uh, it might uh, uh, there might occur uh, blink-related micro, micro trauma at the site of the conjunctival fibrosis after the conjunctival suturing post-quin surgery, which, ca uh, which can cause uh, goblet cell dysfunction. The function of conjunctiva to act as a reservoir of t uh, tears is disturbed due to the conjunctival insult post-rabismus surgery. Uh, there is a complex interaction. So these are the reasons because of which uh, there can be the incidence of uh, ocular surface disease can uh, increase post uh, squint surgery. Uh, third one is there is a complex interaction between the afferent sensory nerves uh, of the ocular surface and the efferent autonomic nerves to the lacrimal gland that modulates both tear composition and the secretion. Any factor that disrupts this relation will lead to tear dysfunction. Conjunctival inflammation caused due to the conjunctival incision that we give during the surgery. Conjunctival microtrauma can cause uh, tear hyperosmolarity, secondary to tear film instability, which can further increase the inflammation and damage the ocular surface. If dry is caused uh, by preservatives that are used in the medicines which we give post-surgery, uh, uh, post then uh, uh, if we stop the medicines, uh, the problem should resolve. So uh, this is a vicious cycle of uh, uh, the ocular surface, uh, uh, the cause of the ocular surface disorder. Uh, dry, uh, so it is characterized by aqueous tear deficiency or excessive tear evaporation at the ocular surface, both leading to tear film instability that uh, results in ocular surface epithelial damage. In addition to the lacrimal gland and the meibobian gland, conjunctiva also contributes to the formation of tear film by the production of goblet cells uh, derived mucin and the expression of membrane associated mucin. So when the conjunctiva is cut, this thing gets disrupted and uh, which can cause uh, dry eye. Conjunctiva can be linked with dry eye through various mechanisms like inflammation, disturbance of tear film and conjunctival fibrosis as I mentioned before. Uh, so long term follow up of these patients and especially patients who complain of ocular discomfort is needed to know if the complaint resolve or become worse. Dry is increasingly becoming a problem due to the increased use of laptops and mobile, um, uh, laptop, mobile, and lifestyle changes. Trabismus sur surgery can aggravate this problem due to the above reasons. Han uh, hence, lubricating drops can be tried on follow up, and Shermers and TBUT can be repeated to know if there is an improvement. Uh, so, it can be concluded that ocular changes do occur after, uh, have occurred, like in our study, they have occurred after one month post uh, strabismus surgery. Long-term lubricating drops can be prescribed and the results can be compared using, using Shermers and TBUT. 
uh, a three month follow up should be we have only done one month follow up but three month follow up should also be done and the uh, test should be repeated on all follow ups and results should be analyzed uh, so the take home message is if any patient uh, post quin surgery is complaining of uh, foreign body sensation or irritation we should be aware uh, that there can be a possibility of dry and it can be treated on similar lines and it has more uh, future it has a more scope of uh, future research thank you, thank you. At the end of yeah, yeah, uh, between two eyes uh, at the end of one month. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. We do. Doctor, what is your post-op regime? Do you give lubricants in, in this one month, or is it just what is your post-op regime? Uh, so, ma'am, in these patients, uh, we uh, we have not given uh, we we just give steroids uh, like uh, antibiotic and steroid composition. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. There, there was no uh, relation between uh, exotropia or yeah, isotropia. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. Three months should also be done. Three months. Yes. Drugs. Yes. Ma'am. Yes. <laughs> And the follow-up of the patients was uh, not very frequent. Like they lost to follow-up after three months. So, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to one and all. Today I'm going to present on the study of effectiveness of botulinum toxin for the treatment of acute acquired competent esotropia. Uh, it is a rare ocular condition that is characterized by acute onset of esotropia associated with diplopia. During this COVID time, due to restricted of outdoor activities and increase of online classes, we have seen an increase in incidence of this condition. It is mainly categorized into three types, that is swan type due to disruption in fusion, burian franchisee type, it is associated with minimal hypermetropia with often associated with physical and psychological stress, Belchowski's type which is due to uncorrected myopia and increase in excess near work. Other causes of acute esotropia is cyst nerve palsy, ocular myasthenia gravis, neurological disorders like tumors of cerebellum. Ours is a prospective study carried out between November 2020 to March 2021. It was done in patients who presented with acquired competent esotropia and received injection of botulinum toxin to the medial rectus muscle of the affected eye. In these patients, a complete history taking was done uh, with precipitating events, nature, duration, the medium of near work, and any history of any previous surgeries or use of glasses. Complete demographic uh, parameters were taken into consideration. Ocular assessment include vision, ac visual equity, binocular vision status, and amount of deviation pre and post injection. Other evaluations like complete cyclopelagic refraction and MRI brain and orbit was done. The criteria for selection was acute esotropia with photographic evidence of previously aligned eyes, comitant esodeviation with normal ocular movement, and a normal MRI scan. Botulinum toxin A injection uh, vial consists of 50 units of lyophilized uh, unit which was dissolved in 1 ml of normal saline. So 0.1 ml of liquid contained 5 units of uh, the drug. All injections were given by the same 
heart surgeon using a 26 gauge needle transconjunctively to the affected medial rectus muscle of the affected eye. All patients were advised to avoid gadget use and reduce near work. We had followed up patients one week, one month, three month and six month post injection. During the follow-up, complete ophthalmologic evaluation including orthoptic evaluation and binocular vision assessment was done. The criteria for successful treatment was complete resolution of diplopia for distance and near, ocular alignment with twin uh, prism diopter of esophoria. In our uh, study, we had total of 15 patients uh, including 6 females, age group of 5 to 25 years with a mean age of 13.4 years. Our success rate was around 66%. That is, 10 patients were treated successfully. Uh, this is the uh, Excel sheet showing the uh, patients whom we had evaluated uh, pre-op, post-surgery. Uh, and uh, five patients had recurrence of uh, uh, squinting and we had advised them corrective squint surgery. This is a photograph of one of our patient pre and post injection, one month and six months. Uh, all 10 patients who were treated successfully maintain a high grade of stereopsis of 120 seconds of arc or better. Ocular alignment was maintained even after six months of injection. The only side effect that was seen post injection was mild to moderate ptosis of the upper lid in four of our patients, which resolved uh, within two months. Other treatment modalities available up use of prisms, which is difficult to wear as it causes a distortion of image, strabismus surgery, which is more invasive and causes muscle and conjunctival scarring and needs a long general anesthesia, while botulinum toxin uh, it is. It can be given transconjunctively uh, with no pain post surgery, and it can be performed under short general anesthesia in children or topical anesthesia in adults. So, coming to botulinum toxin, it selectively acts on peripheral cholinergic nerve uh, terminals, uh, and it causes temporary paralysis, inhibiting the muscle. It causes changes in the length of the tension of the muscle thus maintaining the alignment of the eye for three months, but long-term effects have been documented. The cause of recurrence has, after treatment remains an open question and needs supportive long-term studies for definitive answer. So advantage of our study, we have a definite role for this uh, treatment of acute esotropia and we can avoid need of squint surgery and it is a safe and easy procedure for treatment and early post-operative recovery and patient comfort. These are my references. Thank you. Have been maintained for six months? Yes, ma'am. And we have followed them up after six months also. They are maintaining ocular alignment. Have these patients needed surgery? Uh, like uh, there were recurrence in five patients and those patients we had advised surgery. Uh, uh, we normally advise them surgery after three months of uh, post-Botox injection so that uh, the effect of the medicine uh, is weaned off and then we uh, do a corrective surgery in recurrent patients. You said you asked the patients to reduce their gadget Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I don't know, ma'am, because the patients who had recurrence, we, uh, they had history of use of gadgets, so it, it's... Uh, yeah, subjective. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our next speaker, um, Dr. Bhavya. She will be presenting ocular motility, um, psychology, and dry eye, a new nexus in the post-COVID era. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Bhavya. I'll be presenting on ocular motility, psychology, and dry eye, a new nexus in the post-COVID-19 era. There are no financial disclosures. So uh, both uh, patients suffering from both dry eye disease and binocular vision disorders complain of similar uh, symptom profile, like they have ocular pain, ocular fatigue, and blurry or changeable vision. Not just the, uh, the symptom profile, even the affected patient base and the risk factor profile is similar between these two seemingly not related ocular conditions. So uh, as th there are multiple reports of discordance between symptom severity and signs in dry eye disease. So this discordance could be because of a missing factor. And that missing factor could be an undiagnosed binocular vision anomaly in these patients with dry eye disease. 
Not just the similar symptom factor, we believe that the limbic system is an integrated, uh, integrating link between the ocular surface pain and the ocular, uh, ocular autonomic reflexes, including the accommodation. So they are yet to be explored neuronal pathways that connect the ocular surface pain and the ocular autonomic input. Then came the COVID-19 pandemic, which changed the lifestyle of most of us, which brought out excessive video display unit use, prolonged confinement, increased demand for near work, and thereby increased the incidence of binocular vision disorders. So since there are very few reports exploring the incidence of binocular vision disorders in dry patients with dry related symptoms, and little research on specific psychological traits these patients have, we wanted to identify the proportion of patients with binocular vision disorders among those who present to our clinics with dry eye disease and related symptoms. So this was a prospective interventional study. We included patients with specific symptom profile of ocular pain, ocular fatigue, dryness, frontal headache, who were treated at least for a year with, a tre with a treatment refractory symptoms of the, uh, with these treatment refractory symptoms. We excluded patients with uh, squint and neurological conditions. So this was our patient workflow where we subjected these patients to dry eye assessment, comprehensive orthoptic assessment, as well as a psychology questionnaire, and we treated them according to, the, to, according to their diagnosis. So this was the comprehensive orthoptic evaluation these patients underwent. And they also uh, gave them a 48-item personality questionnaire and also gave, uh, did a uh, dry eye assessment in all the subjects. So just a brief overview on this uh, personality traits. This Ising personality questionnaire gives us. There are more stable personality uh, traits, and uh, the two of them are neurotic personality traits. So these are our results. In our study cohort, 59% of our patients had NSBVA anomalies, and this is the distribution of the diagnosis. And interestingly, 70% uh, 70 of patients who had binocular vision anomalies had either melancholic or choleric personality traits, which were neurotic, unstable personality traits. So. So based on the uh, diagnosis of the binocular vision anomaly, they underwent appropriate uh, vision therapy. Uh, after the vision therapy, major, uh, their mean OSDA, ocular surface dis uh, discomfort index, is significantly reduced with the vision therapy. And 68% of the steady cohort improved with vision therapy alone over three months of the therapy. So we believe that we have, uh, we tried to and we addressed some of these questions like how do we manage treatment refractory dry eye patients? Do they have only dry eye disease or are we looking at a mimicker of dry eye disease in these patients? And in our study cohort, we showed that 59% of them actually had uh, non-strabismic strabismic binocular single vision anomalies. And this is a representative case example where a patient who was treated for a chronic dry eye with a dry eye management alone, but we diagnosed him with accommodative insufficiency and with a uh, vi comprehensive vision therapy, the patient reported significant uh, improvement in his symptoms. So there is an uncertainty as to how to treat how to manage unhappy dry eye patients. And binocular vision anomalies were studied in some of the ocular surface and ectatic disorders. So this is the first large cohort study to show the prevalence of patients with binocular vision anomalies in unhappy treatment refractory dry eye patients. And over 99% of our study cohort improved with treatment and majority of them improved with vision therapy alone. So based on this uh, study, we would like to emphasize that in patients where there is uh, di discordance between symptom severity and the clinical signs, do not just treat them for dry eye disease, look beyond, uh, subject them to orthoptic assessment, and if they end up being diagnosed with binocular vision anomalies, treat them with the vision therapy. Also address their psycholog uh, specific psychological traits, and if they have increased stress levels, uh, address it with a psychological counseling. Thank you. Thank Normal you. Good presentation. Okay, uh, can it, are there any questions, ma'am? Uh, we can uh, call the next speaker, Dr. Kuldeep Kumar Shrivastal. Uh, he's going to speak on medial transposition of lateral rectus without or with splitting for complete third nerve paralysis. Palsy.
very good afternoon to all of you. I am going to begin my study on medial transposition of lateral lectus with or without splitting of splitting with for the complete third nerve palsy. I have no financial interest. Complete third nerve palsy is a surgical challenge to establish because four of the six extraocular muscles are involved. Severe impairment of ocular motility and eyes usually fixed in out and down position. Various approaches have been recess resect of horizontal recti muscle, superior oblique tendon transposition, globe fixation procedure, and medial transposition of the lateral lectus muscle. The purpose of history was to report the result of medial transposition of lateral lectus with or without splitting up for the third nerve palsy. It was a retrospective study, seven eyes of seven patients with congenital third nerve palsy. Age range between 16 and 30 years. All had large XT, more than 50 prism diopter. All were <coughs> myopic. I have not selected seeing eye actually. In, in full, full tendon transposition, 270 degree superior conjectural peritomy was done, and lateral lectus was isolated and secured on double arm for 5-0 polyester suture, and LR was passed under superior rectus and superior oblique and was attached to the superior insertion of medial rectus. Spit tendon transposition, it was the technique which was earlier described by Goikit et al. in 2013. And uh, this is the force reduction test is very important to see the tightness. Here the uh, lateral rectus is moderately tight. Inferior rectus being dissected. The superior rectus being dissected. Lateral rectus being isolated and it is splitted. <coughs> up to around 15 millimeter from the limbus. Now this is single arm, 5 polyester, thibond suture. And each half is secure with that suture. Now muscle is being disinserted. Now this uh, <coughs> inferior one is being passed under the inferior oblique muscle. And this is being passed under the inferior rectus muscle. Now you can see the inferior half has come medial side of the inferior rectus muscle. This is the superior half is being passed under the superior oblique and superior rectus. Now this muscle has come medial to the superior rectus. A scleral bite as bleeding just below and above the insertion of the medial rectus. And this is a muscle is being opposed there. There are one or two millimeter some hang back because it's sometimes it's difficult to pull to that level. Here you can see inferior half has got attached here. Sorry, superior half. And this is an inferior one. Inferior half is attached here. At each follow-up, this uh, one must look for this RAPD, optic-atrophic, choroid diffusion, and indentation of globe. If anything happens, one has to reverse the surgery, go and do something uh, like that. Results here, seven eyes of seven patients underwent this transposition position. Seven has full tendon, four has the split tendon. Initially, I was scared, so I did only full tendon, and later on, I did the split tendon. Pre-op exotropia was more than 50 prism diopter. Post-op alignment was achieved within 20 prism diopter in all the patients. However, there was in induced hypertropia in full tendon group. There was no complication report. This is 16-year-old boy with right total third nerve palsy. This is 9-gauge picture. Adduction is minus 5 and elevation depression is also limited. This is, you can see the post-op. This is one-day post-op and one-year post-op. This eye is urgently aligned, but it has the hypertropia in that eye. This was in that 23 year old female, right third nerve palsy. This is a nine gauge picture. You can see it, adduction is minus six, seven, and elevation depression is limited. This is a after split tendon transposition. At day one, they is aligned, and after six months also, this eye is very well aligned. 
the full tendon transposition was first described by the tailor who uh, who just uh, attached to the superior nasal portion of the globe and that was not very effective but uh, later on it was modified to attach to be attached to the superior rectus superior border of medial rectus and this uh, Saxena et al reported uh, satisfactory alignment but they did in cases of pre existing vertical alignment Kaufman who described split tendon medial transposition and it was later mod uh, he just uh, put uh, 20 millimeter behind the uh, limbus so that was not that effective but later on goikit modified it and got attached it uh, at the insertion of the medial rectus and uh, recent this uh, saha et al reported a good success in this, this procedure so in our study horizontal division was well corrected in all patient however there was the induced vertical division in full tendon transposition so in conclusion, split tendon medial transposition of lateral lecture is safe and effective for correcting exotropia and dispersing. However, full tendon transposition is effective in correcting exotropia but induces vertical deviation and may be helpful in patient with pre-existing hypotropia. If hypotropia is there, then probably one can try and uh, induce hypertropia will compensate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, do you, are you aware of any other modification of this split of the... Yes, what is it? There is the cross and there is the uh, posterior fixation sutures. So I think those uh, posterior fixation sutures, sutures give a better result, a better outcome. Yeah, better mm -hmm. outcome. But uh, I find this itself a little difficult actually, but pulling muscle to that level. Yeah, definitely so, that difficult part is there, but the results are better with the so fixation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have Dr. Saili Mahajan? She was supposed to give the keynote address. She is... Uh, so with that, we conclude our session. I congratulate the speakers for their wonderful talks. And may the best one win. And uh, with this, we conclude. And thank you so much. We are already late, so we won't take much time. Uh, pencil say sign. Can you? Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, total,